question? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Whenever um, you have a question or comment, when you're on Zoom, please use the raise hand emoji to let you know that, let us know that you want to make a comment or ask a question or write it in the chat box. And we'll have our Bevel Query working group members monitoring chat and posting responses along the way whenever possible. And for those in the room, please raise your hand and walk to the front of the room or speak really loud so everyone on Zoom can hear you. The speaker is up here at the corner of the table. And I want to thank all of our speakers ahead of time for their roles in helping us with this evening's program. So thank you. Save Bell Bowl Prairie is not just one organization or one person. It's a community of people and organizations who are working together towards the same goal to save Bell Bowl Prairie. And along with Natural Land Institute, our, working on this initiative are our partners, Friends of Illinois Nature Preserves, the Mississippi Audubon Society, Illinois Environmental Council, and many individuals who have contributed to the grassroots movement to spread the word about this effort through, through their own network and social media and by contacting airport staff and commissioners, local, state, and federal elected officials, either through their own phone calls, emails, or letters, or through the IEC action alert sent to the governor and other elected officials. You can also find out information about this effort on our website, savebellbowlprairie.org. You can find more than 100 news media stories in the press section there. And you can engage with others and watch for information on Facebook under the group called Save Bell Bowl Prairie, and also find us on Twitter and Instagram at Bell Bowl Prairie. Now, we know many of you are familiar with the history of this effort, and for those who may be joining us for the first time tonight, and to refresh the memories of others, I will give you a little background about the Save Bell Bowl Prairie effort. Bell Bowl Prairie is located on the grounds of Chicago Rockford International Airport. It's approximately 8,000 years old and consists of a dry gravel soil. It's a rare prairie ecosystem in the state of Illinois. Less than one one hundredth of 1% of original prairie exists in Illinois today, and this prairie is part of that. In addition to this irreplaceable natural heritage, Belleville Prairie has a significant historical legacy as a place used by soldiers during World Wars I and II known as Camp Grant. In 2018, the Chicago Rockford International Airport and the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, conducted an environmental assessment, or an EA as it's known, of the midfield air cargo development area that includes Belleville Prairie. After this was done in 2019, there was a finding of no significant impact issued, despite the proposed destruction of a high quality state recognized prairie and multiple threatened and endangered species. National Land Institute, which has managed the prairie for decades, was, no, was not notified of these actions. Construction work began in 2021, and in August, local residents noticed activity in the area of the prairie and notified NLI and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Upon visiting the prairie at this time, a DNR biologist identified several of the federal endangered rusty patched bumblebees in the prairie. In September of last year, NLI, Mississippi Audubon, Friends of Illinois Nature Preserves, and others began working together to find alternatives to avoid destruction of the prairie and begin a public awareness campaign with outreach to community leaders and elected officials and the general public through emails and social media, and we began holding public meetings. After pressure from the IDNR, the airport agreed to halt construction until November 1st. Several public meetings were held throughout October, and public awareness of this issue and news stories in the media increased. On October 27th, Natural Land Institute held a news conference to announce it had filed a lawsuit for injunctive relief and a temporary restraining order. The next day, the airport announced that it would halt construction and reinitiate the cons consultation process under the Endangered Species Act with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to evaluate impacts to the rusty patch bumblebee. And that construction schedule to start November 1st was suspended until this process was completed. A new deadline was set for construction on the road to begin on March 1st. That didn't happen. Several deadlines were set by the airport as to when they would restart construction and then changed. We continued to hold public meetings through April. And since last October or last November, Bubble Prairie advocates have shown up and spoke during public comments of the Greater Rockford Airport Authority Board meetings. 
The airport has continued to refuse to meet to discuss potential changes to the road and expansion plans. To wrap up, road construction through the prairie is currently on hold due to the FAA and US Fish and Wildlife Services requiring a new biological assessment and consultation process. This could be finished in the next few weeks. The airport has stated they are planning to restart construction on the road that will destroy the prairie on October 15th. Now, at this time, I will turn over the meeting to Amy Bell, Executive Director of Friends of Illinois Nature Preserves. All right, Joe, where am I supposed to stand? Here? Yes, that's okay. great. Yes. <laughs> All right, so one of the thing, updates that has occurred. Back one slide. Yeah, back one Sorry. slide. Yes, there we go. One of the things that's happened since we last met and last gave an update was that um, the, the FAA um, needed to submit a biological assessment. Once the federally endangered species was found, um, it required that the project go to consultation with US Fish and Wildlife. The most important thing for our efforts to come out of this biological assessment um, was that we finally got information from the airport about their plans and why they have chosen the options that they've chosen. And they had to basically, they now had to show their work about why they were choosing the road that goes through the prairie. So, um, so we've kind of, we've dug through this. If you are interested, I'm gonna go over it at a high level because I'm sure you'd rather hear from um, from these young people that are online too, um, but at a high level, kind of the options that they chose. So you can go to the next slide, Jill. So the um, proposed action, you can see in the green, um, and then it kind of is shaded up there a little bit higher, but the green is the high quality part of Belleville Prairie. So it's the part that we, um, that we really are concerned about. And you can see the gray line that goes through that. That's the road that destroys that high quality part of the prairie. Um, so this shows their updated action, and when we learned in the fall that they were, they said they were gonna, they were gonna reconsider their design. Um, this is the new design that they reconsidered, and you can see it still destroys most of the prairie. Um, it retains 6.2 acres, um, but also it puts the road through the high quality part of the prairie, um, through this remnant prairie. So this is the this is the updated plan. It destroys 9.3 acres and retains just 6.2 acres of the prairie with a road through it. With a road through it. Um, so, um, and as we know, putting a road through a prairie doesn't doesn't save the prairie. Um, it just con continues to contribute to the degradation there. Um, so, but what's also interesting about this biological assessment that we now have access to is they showed us all the alternatives that they considered and then proceeded to tell us why none of those alternatives um, would, would be acceptable and why they're choosing the road going through the prairie. So they considered moving the road um, to a less high quality part of the prairie. So a part of the prairie that has, um, is more degraded, has less biodiversity in it. Um, so they did that. They also considered moving the road um, so that it didn't go through the high quality part of the prairie, um, but it also moves the building. So it, it destroys more of the prairie over the lower quality. And they rejected this option flat out because it says it also shrinks the size of the building and says it doesn't give them the space that they need. Um, and so you can go to the next slide so we can see the other options they considered. Um, again, they moved, moved the road around the, uh, over the, moved the road, but also um, continue put the cargo building uh, over the prairie. And then one alternative they also considered was to build a bridge over the high quality part of the prairie. So they don't destroy the prairie by bulldozing it, but they do have a significant impact and also incur a significant cost, but um, kind of through that um, impractical option of building a bridge over the prairie in there. So next slide, Jill shows um, in their, ta their table of options, the only action that they considered that saved the prairie that didn't destroy any more prairie was to do no action. Um, so there were, they did not address any alternative that would actually save the prairie except doing nothing. Um, and then, and so you can see the alternative action number two. So the original action was the 2019. In the fall, they said, okay, we're gonna reconsider. There'll be a new design and they've come up with alternative two um, and want us to think that by just saving 6.2 acres that now they are saving the prairie. Um, and the other thing to point out is that they saved that 6.2 acres, but they haven't said that they would permanently protect it. They just said they would save it for right now. Um, so, 
can go to the next slide. And you can also see um, that what they've done is a, a, road, a road lifespan to uh, 20 years to predict the safety. So they looked at I got data on how many crashes there would be based on the curve of the road. And so that's the information they're using to say that the road that goes around the prairie isn't safe um, because they're saying that according to the IDOT data, yeah, the curve wouldn't be acceptable based on the average speed limits in Rockford and the average snow and ice in the Rockford area. Um, so that's the data that, that they are using and citing in their biological assessment when they consider the alternatives. Um, and the next slide. Um, so we also took a look at why are they, why can't they just keep the building where it is or move the building and have the road go all the way around the prairie. And what's interesting is this box here at the bottom that they call the future aeronautical related development plan for the ALP, which is the airport layout plan. Um, so it seems as though they can't make the road uh, be a safe, safe road with a, with a more gradual turn because they're saving room for this, this future airport development um, that's never been fully fleshed out. Um, there's no consultation. There hasn't been any public process about that. Um, and so the only design that completely retains the prairie is the no action alternative. I think Jillian is going to talk about um, the biological assessment um, she's going to talk about. So that's the design. So the first part of the bi biological assessment shows us what they considered as far as their, their design um, and why none of those are acceptable. And then there is also a section about the, uh, basically the plants and animals at the prairie. So Jillian's going to talk a little bit about that. All right. Hello, everyone in person and on Zoom. I'm sorry, I'm wearing a mask, so you're not going to be able to look up my nose the whole time. <laughs> but you can still look at my beautiful mask. <laughs> um, so the second part, as Amy was saying, of the biological assessment was they did their version of a deep dive into how this construction process would impact the wildlife on the prairie. Um, and so one of the uh, endangered plants that um, they recognize could be on the prairie. So they did, um, they kind of did a survey for, it was in the wrong season. So they were working with like, dead stalks of plants that would have been there the last season. Um, but they admit that appropriate habitat is present within the action area, which is their fancy way of saying construction zone. Um, and many of the associated species with the prairie bush clover were found there, uh, but they didn't see the actual plant when they looked at the wrong time. Therefore, it's not there. Um, and then another quote that I pulled out of their biological assessment was, they recognize that a significant number of rare and conservative species were identified by the IDNR within the action area, um, but they're just willing to overlook that. And there's a process for them to go and apply for a take permit, which means basically the government gives them permission to destroy those species within the action zone as long as they have government permission, um, which is basically what they're applying for with this biological assessment. Okay, now on to the rest patch bumblebee, which is the federally endangered bee that they found on site, which is the reason they had to do this whole biological assessment. Um, their conclusion was that the action may affect and is likely to adversely affect the rusty patch bumblebee. However, the action would not result in jeopardy of the, or to the continued existence or recovery of the species. So basically, that means that the Endangered Species Act, as a law, only prevents processes like this from happening if it threatens the entire existence of the species. So they would have to prove that the airport is going to decimate all rusty patch bumblebees in the country, in the world, in order for them to be able to say, no, you can't do it. And so since we know that rusty patch bumblebees are generalist foragers, so they'll go on a bunch of different plants. We know that there's many places in the Rockford area that people have seen rusty patch bumblebees in. Um, we know that even though they recognize that this is going to be harmful to this threatened and federally endangered species, that's not enough. Um, and another thing that they pointed out in the assessment was that um, worker bees forage up to one kilometer from their nest. And so they spend a lot of time figuring out whether their construction zone is proper habitat for bee foraging. So collecting pollen and nectar, 
or bee nesting, which is where they like have all their bee babies and it's usually in the ground in little burrows. And then a third option is where they overwinter. So this is where the queens, dang, I have a bumblebee life cycle that I should have brought and I left it in my car. <laughs> Um, so basically, clean bumblebees are the only ones that will survive over the winter, and they need a place where they can be warm and safe to survive over the winter so they can start their new colonies. And so this assessment um, argues that there is no overwintering habitat, which is why they're saying that it's okay that they do construction between October and March, because that's not when the bees are active and collecting pollen and on flowers. And so they're saying there will be no bees in this area. But if we go to the next slide, um, I took some issues with that statement. Um, I'm, I've actually done research on bumblebees and I have worked with a lot of the people they cite in the biological assessment. And it's frankly a fact that we don't know a lot about overwintering, especially for rusty patch bumblebees. Um, there's only been one, one record of an overwintering rusty patch bumblebee queen. And I think that was in Wisconsin somewhere. So we don't really have all the data we need to make an educated assumption about where they're overwintering and where they aren't. Um, and also, it was kind of funny, throughout the biological assessment, they kept referring to the action area as a high potential zone. So there's a high potential that rusty patch bumblebees could be found in that area, which was a little silly because we have photo documented evidence of rusty patch bumblebees being found on the site. So to consider it a potential is, just a little bit of a misnomer, in my opinion. Um, also, for their biological assessment, they use this form from the Xerxes Society, which is um, a nonprofit dedicated to the conservation of insects and other invertebrates. So they're a really cool group, and they use this habitat assessment form that the society put together. And basically, it's supposed to be used as a way for you to predict how you can take your yard, your lawn, your agricultural fields and make it better habitat for pollinators. So you can say, I'm gonna add these flower species in this unit of area. Let's see how much better my land is going to be for pollinators. So the airport took this into the exact opposite, which is not what the form is designed to do. And they said, imagine we take away all of this foraging habitat, all of this nesting habitat, all of these flowers for the bees, then what are we going to be left with? What's going to be left over? So it was a little sad to see that a form that was like supposed to be used for something so awesome uh, for creating more habitat, they just completely took it and warped the intention. And I'm not entirely sure that it's still applicable when you take it in the negative like that. Um, I haven't heard of anyone else doing that before. So yeah, there were some issues we had with the biological assessment. I'll turn it back over to Amy. So just to quickly wrap up what happens next with consultation, US Fish and Wildlife, um, the Illinois Iowa office reviews the biological assessment and basically determine if they agree or disagree with, with the assessment of the FAA. The FAA is the acting federal agency. Um, so we expect that there will be a response from US Fish and Wildlife. Um, sometime in August with their opinion. Um, we do expect based on kind of the research and history of what has happened and what we know of the consultation law and what Jillian talked about that um, destroying Belle Bull Prairie um, is detrimental, it's detrimental, but they are only looking at the, the continued existence of the entire species of the rusty patch bumblebee. So as we are talking through kind of how we advocate for this, we need to keep in mind that that's, that's what the law allows, um, uh, the Endangered Species Act uh, allows. So they're only, that's what they are looking at. Um, but they will likely um, have some recommended remediation actions, um, but they'll also have information about why, and even looking at this biological assessment, there is a lot of information in here and advocates from US Fish and Wildlife and IDNR, um, staff from those agencies all will, will say here is the negative impact, but ultimately the law will likely allow the, the process to continue um, through the consultation process. So, and I believe next up is Carrie, who's online. Do we want to stop and take any questions? I feel like that's a lot of information. That it is. People. Yeah. Yeah. When you say remediation, do you mean mitigation? Like they have to pay money to create prairie somewhere else? Yes. Do we know what the 
cost of the mitigation would be compared to the cost of alternative designs of the road? Um, I'm not sure about the cost um, compared to alternatives, but they did say, oh, yeah. They did say um, in the biological assessment that they are willing to put $150,000 into purchasing prairie seeds um, to be planted on someone else's land. They specifically made a little note that they're like, not ours, because we can't. Not true. Um, so yeah, they said they're hoping to enter this agreement with either the Rockford Park District or the Forest Preserves of Winnebago County to basically give them $150,000 for seeds to plant somewhere. Yeah. Are there any questions online that we needed to address also? Rob, are you monitoring chat for us? Anybody have questions there? Yeah, I'm, I'm answering the questions. I've shared in the chat the, um, the link to the biological assessment and anyone who's in person there, you can email anyone uh, to get a copy of it too, to just really dig in and find new stuff that's uh, not great. Um, but uh, I just wanted to reiterate for folks that um, it seems that there is not a lot of, uh, the, the, the rusty patch bumblebee is not going to um, save it save the prairie. I think that is the, um, what, what we're, we're starting to, to really see. So just so want to reiterate that. Over to Carrie and she can start telling us what will save the prairie. Yep. We can't end the meeting right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and good night. Yeah. Want to make that clear. So <laughs> Carrie, we need you to start your video. Um, my video is started. It's not. There you go. We see you now. Okay, great. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we're really honored to have you here. Um, I just want to give a brief update about uh, what the Natural Land Institute is doing in regards to legal issues and some advocacy. So um, at the moment, uh, we have a lawsuit against the Greater Rockford Airport Authority, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the US Department of Transportation, the Federal Aviation Administration, and the US Department of the Interior. And where those uh, lawsuits stand at the moment is every one of those agencies uh, has filed motions saying that uh, NLI has no standing to bring this lawsuit. So in order to have standing legally, we have to have uh, people in, in our organization uh, who have visited the prairie and gone there. Uh, and of course we do, we feel we have a really strong case. Not only do we have lots of bird watchers who are members who've gone there regularly throughout the years, but Natural Land Institute had an agreement since the late 70s with the airport to manage the prairie, which we have done all of these decades in cooperation with the airport. Uh, the airport even used to have a, a beautiful, um, proud uh, page on their website uh, about the Balboa Prairie and Camp Grant. And uh, so, we feel that we have a very strong case. At the moment, the judge has put all of that on hold, waiting the uh, determination of the consultation process. As soon as the, the, those consultation processes are completed, uh, then we're going to move forward. Now, we uh, want everyone to know that the board of the Natural Land Institute wants everyone to know that we are prepared to go all the way with this. We are prepared to go to appeals. If for example, uh, the current judge that we're going to decides that we don't have standing, we have our appeals ready immediately. And we also have injunctions ready immediately to stop any activity out on the prairie. So, we're prepared to hold this up for years, if possible. 
um, we don't want to do that. We want to have a solution. Uh, and the um, philosophy that we have is that we do want the airport to move forward with its expansion. Uh, and we want to save the prairie as well. The old paradigm of either or, I don't think uh, needs to be anymore. It can be both and, so that we can have both the expansion uh, of our economic engine in the Rockford region, and we can protect the prairie, not just in the short term, but permanent protection for the Belleville Prairie. So um, our board is committed to staying the course, as I said, through appeals and injunctions if necessary. And we're hoping that tonight, um, all of you, all of our supporters are going to be with us in that, in this effort, particularly as we ramp up again towards this fall, which is why we have the ambassadors. So there's just one other thing that I wanted to tell you that we are still having conversations with Durbin and Duckworks office. I went to Washington DC in May and I met with both Durbin and Duckworth's senior staff and they are very interested. They care about this issue and we're currently working with them to see if there are some solutions that we can come up with. So, um, we want all of our supporters, all of you to now keep pushing because as we work with um, Durban and Duckworth and with our local politicians, we really want to make sure that we have this strong groundswell of support. So thank you. Yeah, I think that's probably All right, Rob, um, you're up. Too. I'm up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you, uh, humanless podium. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, we uh, we want to take some time to uh, talk to some folks who've been doing some work to save Bubble Prairie, and um, they are. They are not vintage um, people. <laughs> they are uh, youth, youth, youth-like people um, who uh, know about, you know, TikTok and uh, what kind of sports drinks you should enjoy. And so they're going to talk about some of the work that they've been doing and what's sort of drawn them to the environmental movement, as well as, you know. Uh, how come they aren't like I was when I was a young person and just played video games all day and cried about uh, why no girls would talk to me. So um, we're excited to have them here. And so um, it's, a, it's a panel discussion. And um, Natasha, Olivia, and Kriti, uh, if you could just unmute your mics and I will ask questions and you can take turns. You don't have to answer all of them. Um, but uh, Natasha Batia is a student at, uh, she told me a second ago, uh, uh, Hinsdale, Hinsdale Central. Yeah. I said, I said it right before you did. Um, yes, Hinsdale <laughs> Central. Um, and then uh, Olivia Schickel is a graduate from Pontiac High School who will be going to Illinois State University, my alma mater in the fall. And then Kriti Aaron Kundram is interning with uh, Friends of Illinois Nature Preserves and is a student at the University of Chicago. And so we're really grateful that all of you uh, showed up here um, to talk about the environment and why you care. And so uh, that's a good question to start with. Why, why do you care about the environment <laughs> and not just TikTok? So um, I guess I can go. Um, I really uh, care about the environment because like personally, I love um, nature. I love being out in nature and especially like hiking. Like, like there have been studies that show that like being out in nature is one of the best like stress reliefs for like humans. And I think that like 
for the future, like I really want to make sure that there are always going to be like nature, like areas for people to like go to like relax and kind of see their environment and um, breathe like the clean air. So that's why I'm really um, like passionate about this because um, like it really helps me and I believe that it should always be there to help other people as well. Yeah, my uh, my reason for caring about the nature is very similar to that in that I, um, I'm i from California, so I saw like the wildfires kind of ruin a lot of like nature areas that I really cared about. And I think in general, the world and our like environment and our nature has changed so much even through the years that I've been living. And I think now is the time that we have to care about it and we have to be working to save it because it will be different for our children as it has become different for even us. Yeah, I um, I completely agree with that too. I always, um, for me, it always came down to the the people aspect. So um, I was never really like a kid who loved to go outdoors. I I don't like bugs. I don't like sweat. I don't like any of that. But I know that it's important for others, and I know that it's important to the the continuation of the things that I do love. There's everything that. Um, comes into our lives is in some way connected to nature, whether we like it or not. And if we want that to keep happening, if we wanna keep living the lives that we live and receive the blessings that we receive, we can't do that without protecting the world that we live in. Um, I also, for me, it comes down to seeing, when I was a little kid, seeing those pictures of like turtles with plastic around their necks and just that hurt my soul. So I knew as I got older, it was important to me to make sure that, you know, no matter whether you're a person or you're an animal or you're a bug or whatever, you are always being protected in some way. And I, I want to make sure that um, the world that I leave for my children is better than the one that I came into. All right, uh, you're in charge, thanks. Um, good luck. Uh, so that's great, that's really, that's really great. And I'm glad that you got over your, um, disdain for sweat and bugs um so i was wondering is there anyone in your lives who were sort of like the the introduction to your environmentalism like who who were your uh i don't know what's the who was the gateway that you you've had that, that have brought you to these places um so for me that was really my mom she my mom is an air quality environmental engineer for the state and um she like so she would always tell me about like her projects like I always took interest I'd like ask her like what like what project are you working on now like which industry like she does permitting so she'd always tell me about her projects and like air quality permitting and from her I really learned about like like how um, like permitting works, like how the um, state and federal governments can um, regulate air pollution. But I also learned a lot about the limitations of what the state and federal government can't do when it comes to regulating um, like industry pollution. So that was really like my gateway of like, oh, like, you know, this is a big problem. Like they just don't have enough like power, you know, to properly regulate these industries. Yeah, mine is similar. My inspiration was largely my dad. He works in corporate sustainability. And I think his job didn't originally start in that, but he sort of shaped it to be that. And I was very, very inspired by the way that he took initiative with that. And I think um, the environment, environmental movement in general has a lot to do with big corporations and the government. And I think being able to see um, how he could make a change in that and how Although it is limited, that is one of the places that really change needs to be made was very inspirational to me. Wow, that's that's like big picture for you too. Mine is definitely not that direction. I came to environmentalism through the internet and um, this YouTuber, her name is Shelby um, and she's a sustainable influencer. And I found her and her thing, her kind of shtick is that you, you do what you can control when it comes to, you know, saving the world, you know, it's making those small differences every day coming into those habits in your own life. So I kind of transformed my, my home into a little 
eco bubble. And then um, as I got older, I found other people, um, one of which is my teacher that got me involved with Bubble Prairie. His name is Paul Ritter. Um, he's an environmental superhero. I couldn't do anything without him. Um, it's really those two people. One brought me, um, you know, my passion, introduced me to the world of environmentalism. And then my teacher, Mr. Ritter, showed me that I have the capabilities to go outside of what I can control and start impacting what others can. That is an awesome uh, spectrum of, of the sort of like, you have like policy, corporations, and individual uh, influencers. I didn't know there were environmental influencers. I thought it was just for like purses and stuff. Um, I am hoping that someone uh, can savvily uh, scare up a link to Shelby, the environmental influencer, because I want to be influenced. Um, <laughs> so all, all three of you have actually done work on behalf of Belbo Prairie. Um, Kriti, you've done a lot of work uh, on the website and for our upcoming ambassador trainings. And uh, Tasha, you actually spoke at one of the airport board meetings. Um, and Olivia, you helped organize the, um, the postcard campaign from Pontiac. Uh, that's great. Um, what are some of the other actions or programs for the environment that you've taken a part of? Um, so I'm actually also a part of another organization called It's Our Future, which is also another like youth led organization. Um, so we so I actually helped host a youth panel discussion there as well. Um, it was with, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Juliana v. United States. Yes, maybe. Uh, so it was pretty much uh, youth, 21 youths who sued the United States government over um, like fossil fuel emissions. So there's a movie on it on Netflix called Youth v. Gov. And um, we had two of the plaintiffs from the lawsuit and the director of the movie as our panelists. And then we just like kind of facilitated like a discussion between the community and those panelists. So that was really, that was really um, like an opportunity to like learn. So it was great. Um, yeah, my, when I was in high school, I went to high school in the Bay Area, um, a local creek by my house had a lot of pollution and it was kind of in, it was like, there were lots of efforts from corporations and stuff that were so, sort of ruining the biodiversity of the creek. And I worked with like the neighborhood community to sort of um, advocate for it, like talk to our representatives and like write they had letters in the newspaper and stuff like that, just to get the word out and to like get people to work on cleaning our parks in our creek and um, now in I go to a school in University of Chicago so in the Chicago area I'm part of an organization called Gateway to the Great Outdoors in which I volunteer with young children to sort of teach them about how great the outdoors are and introduce them to like environmental problems it's just like um, the start of like their movement as an environment environmental advocate. Yeah, I love that so much. Um, you, you two are, I'm sorry, I'm just like fangirling. You two do such cool stuff. I'm sorry. Anyway, um, this past year um, through uh, my environmental science class in high school, I was able to um, serve as a student leader on the um, Illinois 30 by 30 Conservation Task Force, Force, which was written, advocated for, um, and passed unanimously in the Illinois General Assembly by uh, my friends and fellow students uh, last school year. And then I had the opportunity to serve on it along with other students where we work to bring the notion of protecting and conserving 30% of Illinois land and water by the year 2030, um, which we did by conducting public meetings and collecting data on the people of Illinois and experts and farmers and everybody in between to figure out exactly what our state needs to grow environmentally. Uh, Christine in chat has anticipated my next question, uh, which is, can you talk a little bit about this, the work that you've done for Bell Bowl and, and sort of what drew you to this particular fight? And I like the order you guys have established, so we'll just keep doing that, Tasha. Okay, yeah. So um, I started, so I gave, um, actually, well, I found out about Bubble Prairie 
through um, one of my environmental organizations, a newsletter. So um, I recently got in interested in biodiversity and was like, like I found out that in Illinois, like there's this prairie is being threatened, especially after like all of our um, legislators signed, like pledged the 30 by 30 to like protect. And that was really startling for me. So that's like kind of how I got into Bevel Prairie. Like, hey, like, this should definitely not be happening. Um, so I actually, I spoke at the airport board meeting in June. And uh, um, also I was at the um, Aurora Pollinator Festival kind of representing like Bubble Prairie to um, spread more awareness to people there. Yeah, I was drawn to Bubble Prairie because I think I saw in it a lot of how like it is a very historically and culturally important prairie. And I saw that in, I remember when I first started doing this, I talked to one of my friends that is from uh, Chicago and he was kind of like, oh yeah, like we went to prairies for all of our um, school field trips. And it sort of resonated with me in that it's such an important like ecosystem for Illinois in general. And I think also being interested in diverse biodiversity, like it was something that I found to like relate to given that being from California and the wildfires are destroying everything that I knew. So um, I found it to be a cause that I really wanted to get involved with. And I've mostly done like background administrative stuff working on like the website and again, like the ambassador kits and stuff like that. So not too much so far cause it's just been the beginning of the summer for me. So um, my involvement, once again, and you'll see a pattern with me, it came from in the classroom. Uh, my teacher, Mr. Ritter, was approached by supporters of the Bell Bowl movement and asked, what can your students do? Um, all of us in that environmental science class had our, had our passions. We had our projects. We, the class was designed to make us have an impact in the world. And... Um, so they came to us and said, you guys are the change makers. What can you do for us? And so we came to the conclusion um, that we were going to make postcards. So we made, if it started out as, I think we just started with about 800. And then I know that the last number was about 1,500, 2,000. We got um, that many postcards made. And then we had our, um, the students in our school, um, write little notes on the postcards. Um, and then we sent them off to uh, Governor Pritzker. We also sent some to Senator Duckworth and Senator Durbin. Um, and then at a later date, we got some more and we went out into the com community into normal Illinois and we had um, people sign them there. So we broke out of just, you know, Pontiac Township High School and we, we went beyond that. And that was very cool. And I had the great opportunity to, um, paint the cover or the design on the postcard, which was great because I can, it gave me an opportunity to break outside of just maybe what's typical environmental activism. I could use art too, which is a passion of mine. And um, I could be on the ground talking to people advocating for their prairie when I, as I was asking them to sign these, which was, it was an incredible experience and I'm so glad that it has had an impact. It actually, does have an impact and it's so great the ways in which you've all been able to personalize these things and bring your whole selves to this uh we don't have a ton of time to talk i did want to give just so i would love for you to give just a little advice to what you've noticed about uh vintage environmentalists um what 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 would be a strategy that you might advise someone who who was born in the last century um, uh, about how to save or protect the environment in a different way than, than what you notice? Um, so I think like, especially for Belleville Prairie, like in um, Rockford, like people who have known the prairie have been the primary audience um, for like Belleville Prairie, like campaigns, like using like, um, like platforms like Facebook, I think is the main Bevel Prairie campaign. Um, I know it sounds pretty cliche to say like use social media, but I really think that it could make a like a huge difference, like even focusing on like Instagram and um, 
using Instagram a lot more to reach tons of people like all over the nation, I think could be a really great idea. But I think there's already like there's so much movement behind Bubble Pray, like it's known nationwide. And like, I think so far, like it's been a great job. Yeah, I would definitely agree. I think my opinion is a little more like um, on the wide, like environmental movement. But I think, as I mentioned before, a lot of emphasis is placed on individual efforts. And I think socioeconomically, that isn't always something that's feasible. And I think that more like emphasis should be placed on government and our representatives and corporations to be making the steps that need to be taken because we as individuals can't go tell the Rockford board to not construct, but you know, our representatives can. So I think that's one thing that Bubble as like uh, organization has, or like the movement has done very well that it's focused on like our representatives and the corporations. But I think that's, that's one of the most important things that I've noticed a lot. Yeah, Kriti, I love that. I love that. I think that um, just to add on to that a little bit is that, you know, you have social media, we have, um, you know, our, our government officials that we're we're pushing for those are those are great goals and I think combining both of those things is um, I always call it advocacy via annoyance and just being relentless you know um, stick to your values without ceasing be public be passionate be proud of it because that's what gets if, if you irritate them enough they'll have to listen to you and that's what I think is going to put us ahead um, and and get our goals met and protect this prairie and do exactly what we need we need to do um, because they can't annoy us or they can't ignore us forever. Um, I think that we have to get into the, you know, get in the governor's ear. We need to force him to listen to us. We need to force a lot of people to listen to us. And if we get enough people doing just enough and it doesn't have to be much, um, we can get their ears listening to us. uh advocacy by annoyance is my new like tattoo i gotta get a neck tattoo that says that that's what the kids are doing right uh follow us on instagram at save Bel or just at double prairie i think we have a t someone someone has the keys to a tiktok somewhere that has done no one has done anything with um so we could definitely look at making viral videos um but uh could we get a round of applause for our panelists today from inside the forest reserve and also in the internets i'll do my jazz hands applause uh thank you all so much um they are great and so we have more agenda to get through that is uh probably less exciting but still important and so we'll uh, we'll move on from there but thank you so much olivia and natasha and kriti you're the best literally the best Is this me still? Am I supposed to be talking about this still? Yes, sure. Great. <laughs> um, so, okay, uh, we've the, the the folks who have been talking about this, uh, we're looking at all the different strategies that we can um, enlist, and I think the uh, the strategy of annoyance is a, a good one to go with. Um, and so, continuing to put pressure on the local officials, the uh, the mayors who uh, appoint the airport board, uh, they're responsible for them and they should know that people are unhappy with them. Um, the state and federal elected officials, of course, the, the ones that have been mentioned, um, I think that it, it seems like Pritzker doesn't want to seem like he's against uh, Rockford jobs. And so I think it really needs to be made clear to him that um, you can be for the environment and for Rockford jobs. No one here wants to take away a job from anyone. And uh, if you can make both work, then maybe you will become president, Governor Pritzker. Um, and then uh, we we have it we have it on uh, somewhat. We've been talking with some folks, and they said that even though some of these corporations, the the clients of the airport, won't acknowledge it publicly they take sort of like PR damage very seriously and so that 
uh, if they see a bunch of people say, if Amazon sees a bunch of people saying that if it weren't for their business, um, the airport wouldn't be expanding like this, uh, and into the prairie, they have, they have a, a lot more like, like, a like our panelists said, they have a lot more of the attention of the, the airport board and the, the staff than, than a lot of us do. And so, um, sort of re-upping on all that. And we, we have, uh, all that information on all the contact information for all of these people on the, um, save prairie.org website. Uh, and then there are a bunch of events that you can show up to. It was referenced earlier, the Aurora Pollinator Fest, which I wish every city had a pollinator fest. Um, and so maybe we could go to the next slide um, because that is uh, apropos. So um, we are starting a thing called the Prairie Ambassadors, the Belleville Prairie Ambassadors. And essentially it's a brief training that we'll be doing via the interwebs where um, basically we'll try to get all on the same page around talking points, the best way to annoy. Um, and then there is a bunch of events coming up like the Boone County uh, Fair and uh, farmers markets and other pollinator fest type things that will need people to sit at a table and um, hand out postcards for people to sign just like uh i think that's olivia in the picture there is that is that olivia is that you olivia right there i think it is yeah sorry i was trying to unmute yeah that is me and then my two um my partners my teammates my friends yeah that's us <laughs> that's right so bring your partners your teammates and your friends and become a bell bowl ambassador um and i am going to get the link to the sign up form we already have 20 folks signed up to be ambassadors um and uh obviously you don't need any one of us to tell you you're amb an ambassador but we are trying to coordinate everyone together um and that giant bee puppet there the rusty patch bumblebee puppet will will show up there um laura would you be able to talk briefly about this hi everyone um i just wanted to say a little bit about being a prairie ambassador. So that giant puppet that you see there was made by me and a few other people from um, Rising Tide Chicago. And that's a really great, We that's at the Pollinator Festival in Aurora. And we, um, that draws people's attention in. And we start talking to them and everybody was taking pictures with that giant bee puppet. And it was a great way to draw people in to tell them about the prairie. Um, and we had a um, hundred, at least a hundred people sign and send these postcards that um, we had. We actually ran out of postcards. So uh, people really care about this. So I just wanna say that um, being a prairie ambassador and going to these events, people are very concerned about this and are really, really wanting to help. And so if you're an ambassador and you have a stack of postcards and they're already stamped and you can have people fill out who they wanna send it to, um, it's, it was really exciting. I was, I was working with Tasha and a couple other people and we had a great time there. Um, also, I love that Olivia made her own art for this. And I would also say any kind of art that you have that you want to, as an ambassador, bring to your event to grab people's eye um, so that they come and talk to you is a, a really a great thing. And if you don't have your own art um, in the kits, there are some um, you know, resources from the actual Belleville Prairie website where there are already some amazing artists who have done some incredible things. Um, and I've even, I made a trifold um, to draw people in and I actually took quotes from um, Rob's article in the Chicago Tribune and made those big so that that catches people, uh, catches people's eyes along with some um, pictures. So there's a lot of different ways and everybody can bring their own part to it to, to um, inspire other people to take action. So I really encourage you to sign up to be an ambassador and start just going to these events, even one or two. If we get another hundred postcards sent, that's really awesome. 
these events are fun too. Like I've done tabling and flyering for events before where people are just like rude to you. But when you're talking about like cute little bumblebees and flowers and pretty things, like everyone wants to talk to you and they're all super nice. I think the worst comment I had was like, just like, why doesn't the airport do something about it? I'm like, great question. And that's as negative as it got. Um, so they're really fun times and it's a good way to just meet people in the community who also care about this stuff too. So yeah, uh, we'll be doing the, we'll do an online training and an in-person training. And if you can't make it to the ones that we have scheduled, the one that I know that is happening is gonna be on Sunday at 3 p.m online on the zooms um but uh there will be in-person ones in rockford as well and uh it's also a great way to just sort of uh meet people who aren't jerks um if hey. you're interested in that hey rob this is carrie yes um i was wondering were you going were we going to try and get people to sign up tonight for the um boon there why yes uh awesome. li live and in person uh you can sign up to table at the boone county fair um where you can uh we'll have a table about belleville prairie at one of the largest county fairs in the region um and uh yeah we'll, we'll get the bee puppet out there and it's going to be fun so you can sign up uh there or if you're interested and you're not live in person um just let us know and we'll make sure that you can get into the fair for free and go look at some really large animals and uh and some good pies we need to sign rob for some chips oh yeah rob would sign up for some chips sign up are there postcards online that you can print yes if you go to the link i shared up there uh it's on our website under shareables there's a bunch of stuff that you can use if you can't get a way to print it so it looks pretty we can make sure to just send you the actual file um and so uh we could keep answering questions that people have it is 801 and we do like to do our little moment of action so that this large group of people uh can take this time uh to speak out in the world so um if you could, uh, if you're in person, Jillian has some postcards that she's passing around now, I think. Um, I'm assuming, actually, I have no idea what Jillian's doing, actually. Maybe she's just We've sitting got down. We've already addressed to a bunch of different people, so you can choose who you want to send one to. You can send one to each person. You can just like write a little sad face and put like, I don't know, do what you want. Make it a beautiful postcard and we'll send it to you. People that are already stamped and everything. So when you're done, we can take them back and I'll send them out tomorrow. So please fill them yeah. out. That, that is a, a ambassador strategy that Laura uh, keyed us in on is when you hand out postcards for people to sign, take them back from the people and say, I will mail this for you um, because otherwise they'll just end up on the floor of their car. Yeah, 100%. Rob, can I just say one more thing? Of course. Yeah, that's a super important part is to make sure you get the postcards back so you can mail them. Also, if you crochet, <laughs> you can find the TikTok bee pattern online and then just add a little rusty patch to it. And you can make stuff like this too. That's another like way to get people to come over to the, um, to your table. I almost came through your screen. It was so cute. Um, <laughs> really cool. Uh, so um, yeah, if you have some moment, if you're online right now, uh, please make us a, a social media post with Save Bubble Prairie, um, direct it, at uh, your friends, your family, so they can learn about it, or at um, you know your Pritzkers, your uh, your Tom McNamara's, your uh, Rockford Airport Board employees. I'm sorry, they're not employees. They're they're a volunteer board. They're appointed, um, and so tons of stuff is on the SaveBubbleParade.org website with the What Can I Do part but if you could just do one thing right now with the hashtag save bubble prairie or two things that would be dope um oh and i should mention too that uh i pretended not to know what a social media environmental influencer is but there is one at our uh at our meeting tonight um there's more than one actually uh and so um if you 
want to do stuff on your social medias, little posts, um, little little videos uh, with gifts, uh, please do. Uh, that would be super helpful. We could have 54 social media influencers for the environment on the call tonight. That's right. That's right. I mean, I, I'm sure there's some smartphones at live too that people could, oh, yeah. could, could tweet. Rob, um, Amy's going to talk about the fair and how people can help out at the Boone County Fair. So we know yeah. there, are, there are a lot of opportunities coming up for tabling and for advocating, but there's one that we've already committed to, um, knowing that um, advocates and ambassadors would, would show up and help out. So the Boone County Fair is August 9th through the 14th. And we have agreed that we will have uh, Belleville Prairie ambassadors at the table each day of the fair. So there is a sign up sheet here um, on the table for anybody who wants to sign up tonight, or you can send an email to Rob can put my email address and his email address and Jillian's email address is in the chat. Um, and so if you are interested in taking a shift, please split it into two shifts a day. Um, each of those days from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and then from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, each day we'll have materials there. We can also probably use some help of anybody who wants to, uh, to take a lead in helping coordinate setting up or tearing down at the end. We'd love to have a lead volunteer to do that as well. But um, it's an exciting opportunity to really spread the word, I think, um, in the region and to advocate regionally. So, um, and uh, we would love for people who are doing that to attend an ambassador training, but if you're not available, um, we'll give you a private tutorial on the ambassador training before you start working it. So just let us know. Anything else that, are there any other questions online that we need to answer or any questions in the room? There were a lot of online questions that happened while I was talking. So I'll, I'll scroll up, but yes, um, feel free to ask again. Showing you want to corner people at the door and make sure they fill out a postcard. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's your exit ticket, people. <laughs> All right, Rob, anything else? Oh, um, uh, Ria Palomares is making handmade bee earrings on Instagram to raise awareness and a little bit of money. And so you can follow them at Denim Trench Coat, which is a really good Instagram name. Um, just re, re shared that. Um, and yeah, I'll reshare the ambassador um, sign up form too. Uh, we got at least one person who signed up already during the meeting. But I think that's all, unless people have other questions. Yes. Are you doing anything at the Winnebago County Fair, which is the week after Bowling, and it happens to be the county in which Bell Bowl is located? <laughs> We, I, I will ha we'll have to check with Carrie. I know she was looking into it. Um, and we were also looking into fair attendance and which ones had bigger attendance. Yeah. So I thought Carrie said that we had missed the deadline to sign up for the Winnebago County. Fair. Yeah, they might not have been as flexible with their deadlines. So, uh, and, and also, um, it's not as big of an audience. And it takes an awful lot of capacity and time and energy to set up and organize people to be there. So we didn't feel we could do two fairs. So, but, we, chose, so we chose the biggest one. But if you know someone who already has uh, something to present at the Winnebago County Fair, or you have an inn, or you can sit at someone's table or something, you know, uh, there's plenty of opportunities that we would, be, we would I think we would love to help coordinate that with you. It's just yeah, the one somebody... that this group is coordinating is the, the boon. Right. Any other questions? We will set a date for a meeting probably in September and we'll notify people in the same channels. So social media, email, stay tuned, um, and stay connected and fill out a postcard. All right, anything else? Yes, yes, oh. someone asked where the best place to give donations was. And I I think the GoFundMe is probably the best one right now. 
Um, and please, this this could be a great action too. Is please share this around. Um, that gets that gets shared around for people working on Bell Bowl. Oh, also the airport has another board meeting uh, this Thursday at 5 p.m. And we're always looking for people to sign up and speak at those meetings just to address the board and remind them that we're going to keep annoying them and taking up all of their uh, public comment slots um, for as long as they continue to ignore us. Uh, so yeah, sign up if you have something to say. And I know everyone does. Feel free to email us if you want help signing up or you get the sign up link too, and we can send that out. So if you're available to speak on Thursday and you're online, um, check in with Rob. If you're here and you're available to speak, check in with Jillian. All right, now, is there anything else? I think even if you're not speaking here for it's important to go. Yeah, wear your shirts, carry your sign. Yeah, um, if, if you are available on Thursday night at five and you can go to the meeting, even if you're not speaking, it's still important that advocates and ambassadors for the Prairie continue to show up um, so they know that we're still, we still care and we're still paying attention and we still want them to change their mind. And we're still watching them. Yes. Anything else? Okay, now we're done. Rob, anything else from the chat? Just that everyone's so great, it's so nice. Yeah, thanks again to all the parties. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Right, yeah. See you soon. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you, oh, Thank, you. Thank you, Olivia. Bye, guys. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Oh, that would be awesome. Oh, Daniel. Um, I am going to do a picture of my voice and I'll write down your email and I can send you some.